Good morning. If you will, open in your New Testaments with me to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. I always tell Bowie this, I'll just go ahead and say it publicly, but the first, I think, three times that Kashka and I visited, twice visiting him once right before the shutdown, he was leading singing basically every time. And so I thought he was just the song leader here. That's just the way it is. So it feels a little bit like pre-pandemic Kaaba Heights to have Bowie leading singing again. In Romans chapter 1, though, you have verse 16, of course, which has all of the press clippings. I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God of salvation to everyone who believes. Yes, to the Jew first and to the Greek. And we think about this is wonderful. The salvation is possible for everybody. We should be excited. We should be exhilarated by that fact. And what does our world do with it? With religious freedom and with the internet and with all of that, you know what a 2007 survey said? About four out of 10 people could name that one of the 10 commandments was thou shalt not kill. And in case you think that that's impressive, eight out of 10 knew all the ingredients in a Big Mac. Okay, now think about that. Twice the amount of people in America knew, at least according to this study, every ingredient in a Big Mac from McDonald's, about four in ten, knew that thou shalt not kill was one of the Ten Commandments. I would say we're probably wasting a moment there. Now, on the other hand, we talk about Bible passages and reading the Bible. And reading the Bible is critical, it's crucial, but more than that is living it. I will say, growing up in a generation that eventually got used to the internet without that super annoying noise and taking like 20 minutes to get onto it, you learn that, hey, maybe I don't have to memorize everything. It was often taught growing up, it's important to memorize scripture to have it. That way you just know it. You don't have to look up anything. You don't have to look in an encyclopedia. Half of you are like, what's that? And you don't have to understand anything other than what you already have committed to memory. Well, that works unless you're preaching like I am somewhere in Florida and the power goes out completely in the entire building. And then all of a sudden, that Bible and that PowerPoint doesn't do you a lot of good when you can't read something that's right here, not because I'm old, because it's dark. It's tough. It's important to know the scriptures. And so when we talk about utilizing God's word, being thankful for the blessing of salvation, we have to think, I've got to know the Bible more. That's true. We do. We think, I've got to pray more. That's true. We do. But this morning, as we talk about the need for growth, I want us to fixate not just on, will I pray more? Or not just will I know more memorized scripture. Both of those are crucial goals that matter more than even when you're preaching and the lights go out. They matter in our everyday life. But growth is so much more than just knowing and doing some things by habit. In Romans chapter 1, continue with me in verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be made known about God is plain to them because... God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. As we think about the need for growth, we understand that with salvation being available to all, we have a choice. We're moving forward or we're moving backward. In athletics, we get this all the time. A coach that constantly has a middling record will get fired eventually. Now, if you start out really bad and you get to be really good, that, that medium type of record is good. But after a while, what happens? We expect more growth. We expect more progress. The problem is for Christians, and I want to be really honest about what the goal of today's lesson is, it's to talk to Christians who have been around for a while. That is to say, not just that I've been a Christian forever. Maybe you're a young Christian. That's awesome. Maybe you're thinking about being a Christian. That's even more awesome. I'd love to talk to you about that. But if you have been a Christian in a state like Alabama, chances are your family have been Christians. And maybe even your family's family has been Christians. And by the way, a lot of your family families are marrying each other. And that's kind of weird, but it's what we do. Right? You think about the need for growth. To a new Christian, we look around and we say, hey, there's a lot to study. We need to get you involved. We need to be practicing what we study. We need to learn more. Here's some good resources. Here's someone to study with. Here are the elders to meet with. But does that really disappear because my parents were Christians? Or because my grandparents on one or both sides were Christians? Maybe their parents or maybe my uncle or my cousin are Christians? Well, no. And I think we're really honest about two empty platitudes. We mean them, but they come across empty. When I say, does everyone sin? If I ask for a show of hands, I say, does everyone sin? Everyone will go up. We don't want to be lying. Romans 3.23 says, all sin and fall short of the glory of God. And I've had to argue that with someone before, but for the most part, we all agree. We've all sinned. You know what's empty? We don't often name our sin because we're ashamed. 
Rightfully, we should be ashamed of sin, but we should be willing to repent and change from it. But on the other hand, we'd say, who needs to grow? Every hand goes up, right? We all need to grow. No one wants to be the person who has a pride problem because then I can talk about those scriptures. But how? How do I grow? If I grew up just knowing all about the scriptures, I'm constantly learning, and I'm in a a church that does things, quote unquote, the right way, and and has done them the right way for a while, where am I supposed to grow? Where is the bandwidth? Well, in verse 18, you notice there is a a strong dichotomy. We're moving forward, or we're moving backwards, and backwards is away from God, and that's a huge problem, because in verse 18, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Now we look at that and we say, that is a terrible group of people. And in verse 20, God says, you should know me. You can't just say, well, these people are wicked because they didn't know God. No, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, verse 20, do you see the second one? His divine nature have been clearly perceived when? Since the foundation of the world. Notice that last phrase in that verse, so that they are without excuse. So no one has an excuse, and we say, well, these are people who just didn't know. Well, no, God says that's not true. But notice in verse 21, this strikes me. In this passage that's going to continue with verse 24, therefore God gave them up in the lust of their bodies to impurity. Verse 26, for this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions. And in verse 28, since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness and evil. Sounds like a horrible group of people. Where does it start? Verse 21. Verse 21. Although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. So the question this morning is, am I, are we, as individuals, moving forward in our faith or not? Because you can call it neutral. You can call it moving backwards. God calls it failure if we're neutral and moving backwards. We are expected to grow. How? Why? That's what we're going to talk about. And so when you look at Romans chapter 1 and you look at this whole section, you see a group of people who were undoubtedly wicked and that God said, you should be better because you should see me. Now, as you key in on verse 20 again, what does it mean, his eternal power and divine nature? I'm supposed to look at a tree and all of a sudden know what the Ten Commandments are? Well, of course not. But when I look around, I need to see that there's something bigger than me. And if there's something bigger than me, I should be what? Investigating. I should be interested in why is this like it is? Not so that I can just ask questions, I can have intellectual curiosity, but so that I can find God. Notice his divine nature. What's kind of a modern English translation for that? Something that's not bound by the physical. He's not caught up in our physical shells or even living in our physical box. God transcends us in every way. I should be looking for him. And so when I find God, when I see that he is great, that means I'm going to owe him my life. Because if there is a creator and I am not him, I am the created, I owe him everything. Again, I must press forward. And we understand this, but notice again in verse 21, they were without excuse at the end of verse 20. But we are expected to honor him and give thanks to him. Now, when you honor someone, you see and you investigate what do they want. And you give it to them. Now, here's a question. If you knew someone for a long time, and you know what they want, and you just kind of say, maybe you make their favorite food. I'm all all about food. You all know that, especially ice cream. You make my favorite ice cream. I don't care how you deliver. I'm thankful for it. Okay, but eventually what happens is if you just kind of have someone over, and you just kind of throw it in front of them, like, hey, I know you like this. Here it is. Just just get off my back. Here it is. Does that feel like a good honor? You know, I did what you wanted. I, I know how you like it. I hated every minute of it, but I gave you what you wanted. Don't you feel honored? Don't I seem thankful? What can happen is as we live as Christians for a long period of time, or maybe it's from an inherited quote-unquote point of view, is we kind of just think, well, I I know what God wants. I'm giving it to him every week. Honor is more than following rules. Honor is more than knowing what someone cares about. It's delivering it in a honoring way. Maybe even a way to clarify that is to look at that second phrase, to be thankful. It's easy to not be thankful for something we get used to. I'm going to tell you, I often don't think about air conditioning. But when you live in Florida or in Alabama in the summer and air conditioning goes out, you are very thankful for air conditioning. By what we don't have, we often are thankful for what can fill its void. But when we have faith for so long and we see God's blessings on us all around and our life is so easy, can I really say that I'm as thankful today for my salvation? as I was years ago. And maybe even, am I as thankful for my salvation today with my family background as someone that just found the truth is tomorrow? 
See, often there's this joy, an unbridled desire to serve Jesus. When we realize, I have sins and God will forgive me. Isn't that the great news of verse 16? Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of God, for it's what? His power unto salvation. That's amazing. That is transcendent. That gives us life. And when we talk about being thankful, we're thankful for air conditioning. It's a good thing to be thankful for. We should add that to the list. We need to always be remembering that salvation is what this is about. And so without that, we recognize that we have some problems. Sometimes we fail to grow. And I just want to be really honest about what are some of those reasons. One of them is, in verse 21, we get distracted. One of the reasons we fail to grow, it isn't because we're just wicked people or horrible. We look at verse 18, the wrath of God is against all those who are unrighteous and suppress the truth. And we say, well, I'm not that kind of person. But maybe I'm a verse 21 person. Although they knew God, we, as a group here this morning, know God. I know that because we're in God's word right now. But even though they knew it, they didn't honor him or give thanks to him. Why? Well, the verse does continue, and, and we're going to hold off on verse 22 and 23 for a moment. But notice the last phrase. They became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Well, why? Again, we'll see some clarifying in just a moment in verse 22 and 23. But would we be just honest and just say, look, I, I know we need to grow. I know all Christians have sin. i got to cut out the sin. i got to bring up the righteousness. That's obvious. But it's just got a lot going on. Have you ever had a pipe burst at your house before? You know what starts getting fired up real quick? YouTube, Google, the old yellow pages, except online, right? Because no one's going to carry that book around. You're looking around, and you're saying, I need this fixed. This is number one on the priority list. It went from last, I don't think about pipes, I don't want to have to think about pipes because they're fine, hopefully they're doing their job, to this is all I can think about because my house is ruined now. And all of a sudden, we're not distracted anymore. We learn more about pipes than we ever knew again. Gosh, can I just had a fence outdoor finished. I learned more about a fence in the last two weeks than I knew about fences in my entire life. I gotta tell you, that's a really low bar. But it became a much higher priority because it was down. And there were random animals in our yard because my fence and our neighbor's fence was down. I woke up, there was somebody's dog in our yard right outside our back door. That made me pay attention. I learned a lot more about lumber and lumber prices. Like I tell you, people are very upset about that right now. We get distracted. We need to grow. We know that. We know God. But we're not growing. Why is that? Is it God's fault? No. Why am I not making it a priority? Well, maybe it's because Satan does a really good job. I don't think Satan just distracts us with sinful things. That's true. Again, my point of lesson this morning is not that sin is good and that Christians who have been forever are terrible. But no, but specifically for those who are Christians and understand who Jesus is, there are unique temptations, not just to fall away from God entirely, but for Satan to come in and say, it's okay. Just miss out on a couple of these windows of opportunity. Don't pray today. It's okay. You're tired. You worked really hard. Just go to bed. Your family doesn't need to think about God as a group. You don't need to think about God as an individual. It's okay, just one time. It'll be okay. Because when things need to be done, school has a start time. Work has a start time. And even when it's on Zoom, you've got to be there and at least from the upper half be presentable for when you are on the camera. We hit that almost every time. But why am I not growing? in my faith? Maybe do I have a patience problem? Do I need to work on self-control? Do I need to work on Bible knowledge? Do I need to work on my prayer life? Do I need to work on encouraging others more? What am I doing to work on it? If the answer is nothing, the question is, where's my time going? Am I sitting around? And if so, don't be lazy. But most of us aren't just sitting around doing nothing all the time. We're doing a lot of good or neutral things. But good and neutral pales in comparison to godly and great things. What am I putting first? Maybe I'm distracted. I also want to see that we think maybe we know enough. In verse 22 and 23, this is part of their problem, right? They knew God, but they became futile in their thinking. Verse 22, claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. So they took what they knew, verse 21, and they exchanged it in verse 23 for images. In verse 22, how they do it along the way? Yeah, we know the Bible's right. They became fools. We get that. They did it claiming to be wise. Do you see that this is Satan's absolute win? He took people who knew God, and he didn't just like set them on the sideline. He let them exchange for a lie and consider themselves wise in the process. We are so smart, aren't we? One of the issues with growth is you really only grow when you feel like you need it. And after you've been a Christian for a while and you've kind of learned and you're doing things, quote unquote, the right way and you're with people who think the right way is important and you do this and you do that, you start to think, you know, really, is it that important that I examine the scriptures daily? 
I mean, I, I'm worshiping right. And, and more importantly, my church isn't worshiping wrong. That tends to be one of our focuses. I'm not saying that's unimportant. That's usually something that's at the top of the list. I worship right. I don't give money wrong. But what does God want from us? He wants us to be changed in every way, not just on Sunday morning or on Wednesday night or on Gospel Meeting Tuesday to do the right thing, but always to be a changed person, to be a light in the world. That means a light of the church building, yes, but more importantly, a light in the world outside of the church building. And that means I have to think, I have to study, I have to grow, I have to know. I don't know enough right now. And so I'm not just preparing for that future evangelistic battle. That's important. It's good to be ready with scriptures, but I am ready to live out a Christ-centered life. Notice with me in Luke chapter 12. In Luke chapter 12 and verse 48. As Jesus is giving a wonderful parable, as always, about the need to be ready and what the Lord expects, what a faithful and wise manager would provide and expect. When you see in verse 48, what you need to examine is for someone who has grown up with a lot of advantages, someone in America, someone who has Bibles and commentaries available on a whim, someone who maybe even came from a family that practices Christianity. Notice this last phrase in verse 48. Everyone to whom much was given of him, much will be required. And from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand the more. This principle, even lifted out of the parable a little bit, fits with many of Jesus' parables on stewardship, whether it be of talents, meaning a money instrument, or even of what it means to follow him, which is to say immediately, let the dead bury their own dead in Luke 9. You follow me. You examine this and you say, as a Christian in this country, maybe with my or your background, God doesn't just expect me to not do bad things. He expects us to do great things. You see that that's a problem now? Now I have to grow because it's not about this minimum threshold. We teach Christianity so much as if it's a minimum threshold. There's so much effort into getting someone to like the starting line of a race. And how much, when you, if you're watching any Olympic coverage, how much... Import, how important is it to get to the starting line? It's pretty awesome to be an Olympic athlete and to be overseas and to be competing on a national stage or an international stage. That's awesome. That is cool. But how good does that do you when you're at the starting block and you don't move and everyone else shoots past you? You'll be in last place. We spend all this time getting ready for the starting line. God says, I don't want you to get a starting line. I want you to do great things in my kingdom. I want you to be an impact, a force of righteousness. That takes growth. I can't do that in day one. I might not be able to do that in year one or decade one or decade two. That takes life experience. That takes time to be with others, to understand how do I relate to someone. I have to be with them when they are hurting. I have to be with them when they are celebrating. Paul would say, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Sometimes it's hard to do both halves of that. But unless I'm there, I won't grow. And sometimes we think we know enough because we're like, well, I got the basics. I know how to get to the starting line and I know kind of what the end line looks like. But if I'm going to do great things, I got to be ready. It's one thing to win a race in your community. It's another thing, isn't it, to win a race then in your state, in the country, on the continent, and then to go to the Olympics and win. That's a different level of skill set required at every turn. And what we have to do is we aim at the most base level or maybe level two. We think, as long as I get there, I've done and I know enough. That's not what God calls people to. In fact, it's not a competition at all. God calls us to do the best we can with what he's given us. And if he's given you a head start with your family, use it. If he's given you a head start with the internet and with American culture, we need to be using it. If not, can I say I'm a proper steward of what God has given me? The answer would be no. I do not know enough. I need to grow. And really what it comes down to, if you look at Romans, again, chapter 1, and we'll read instead of scanning quickly, Romans chapter 1 and verse 24, you see that this is, these are people who just chose not to. This really wasn't just some slip of the mind. It wasn't because they were so well educated, it was okay. It was a purposeful perversion. In verse 24, therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to the nation. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. 
They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossip, slanders, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. you got to look at that list and you say, that's a horrible list. And maybe you're like me and you look at that list and you say, I really hope I'm not in there, but maybe I actually am. I need to work on that. That's an area for me to grow specifically. We're going to talk about that in just a minute as we wrap up. But notice this group from verse 28 who was given over by God to a debased mind. God allowed them to do that. But there was a digression, wasn't there, from 24, 26, 28. And it all started back in verse 20 with people who should have known better. They were without excuse. Verse 21 says explicitly, they knew God. And yet they live like this. Why? Because they wanted to. The things of this world, the right now, the this week, the this year, the this lifetime, was more important than God. I understand on a Sunday morning, it's pretty easy to be fixated on, hey, I'm doing the right thing. That's good. I'm so glad everyone's here. And for everyone who's on Zoom because they can't be here, that's awesome. I'm thankful. Everyone is a part of worshiping God and learning from his word. That's fantastic. But are we willing to grow individually and not just offer that bare minimum and say, God, here, take what is yours. Now I'm going to live with the rest is mine. See, that's the mindset problem, isn't it? What am I growing for? If I don't know why I'm growing, let's study the word together. Go to the elders. They will happily shepherd you on, hey, here's some things we can work on together. Here's some things you can work on yourself. May this never be us that we don't want to. So how can we grow? Three quick ways. One of them is, going back to Romans chapter 1, is to be thankful. This comes up all the time, and I think we, we go over being thankful, and we just read it as, yeah, I just need to be thankful, I need to be happy. That's true. We, we should be happy, we should be thankful. But notice, this is linked with the people who lost their faith. With the people who are described in verse 18 as receiving the wrath of God, they knew God, they were living in unrighteousness, they were filled with all manner of evil, and it all started with not giving thanks to God. That seems peculiar until we understand maybe a little bit more. Look at me in 1 Timothy chapter 1. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, as we consider verse 12, notice Paul's perspective. Now Paul has a rough background from a Christian point of view. He was very well trained from an Old Testament scripture standpoint, not as a Christian. But he's realistic in a way that, frankly, we need to be realistic. 1 Timothy 1, verse 12. I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service, though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent. I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. I receive mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Did you notice in verse 12, he does what? He thanks him. And in verse 17, he says, what, does, what belongs? Honor. Remember Romans 1.21, although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. This honor and this thanks were important in the life of Paul. In verse 12, he starts out, I thank God for what? That I, as the King James would read, the chief of sinners, can be allowed mercy and forgiveness. That I understand who the king of the ages is. And so I'm not going to grow stale in growth because I realize every day two critical things. Number one, God is God and I am not. And that means my room for growth is immeasurable. And I don't just say that and go, all right, I need to grow and then go back to doing nothing about it. I need to grow to be like him. That means I'm going to make a specific plan. I'm going to work on it. Number two, I realize I will not get there. Okay? I'm not trying to depress everyone. I'm going to come back on that, I promise. I will not get to that perfect level no matter how much effort or planning I put in. We've got to see that. Because when we try to be perfect, you know what happens? You burn out because it won't work. But where is there something that works in God? And the king of the ages who allows what? Grace. And verse 16, I received mercy. We need God. We need God not just to know what our example of what we should be growing towards is, but so that we can have forgiveness, so that we can know every day, I am the chief of sinners. Paul says in verse 13, I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent. My list could be much longer, and I'm sure yours could be too. Every day we should remember how thankful we can be that God sent Jesus to die for us. He didn't send Jesus to die for the whole world. He sent Jesus to die for you by name, for me by name. 
It wasn't a bulk purchase. It was a collection of individual purchases. He did that for you and for me. And so what do I owe him? Everything. So how do I do that? Well, I need to be thankful. I need to remember where I came from and who I am. The other thing is I need to aim for something specific. And here's where we're really going to wrap up the lesson. There will be one more point, obviously, because, you know, me and three points on a slide. But in Hebrews chapter 5, in Hebrews chapter 5, you recognize that there was an expectation of growth. In chapter 5 and verse 11, about this we have much to say and it's hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Number one, if we are wondering what a mature Christian looks like, verse 14 is a pretty good definition. Someone whose power of discernment is trained by what? Constant practice. That means I have to be able to know the word, the meat of the word. I have to be able to distinguish it consistently. I can't live in the sand. I can't live in a cave. Distinguish good from evil. But you notice in verse 11 through 13, he's mad not just that they haven't developed. And by the way, I think this also illustrates the idea that if you're not moving forward, you're moving backwards. But notice specifically, what is his problem in verse 12? By this time, you ought to be teachers. There was something specific. They were missing out. The kingdom of God was being damaged because people said, I can't or won't grow. And see, this is hard. In a church like this, and when we come from families that you do, maybe they give you a good start in understanding who God is, it's very difficult to say, hey, if I fall away, what's the harm? You say, well, my soul's lost, so I won't do that. But what if I just kind of drift? What if I'm just there? Right? I mean, the church is going to be strong, right? They've got preachers, they've, they've got elders, they've got deacons, they've got great singers, they've got song leaders, they've got some people working behind the scenes, they've got caregivers, they've got encouragers. They don't need me. That's just not true. God needs every one of us. Number one, we need God. And so even if he didn't need you, you need to be striving to be like, God, I need to say, hey, God expects better of me. But number two, God needs all of us work is to be done. You say, maybe I can't be a teacher. That might be at this moment, but in verse 12, the Hebrew writer clearly thinks some people who weren't qualified should have been. That means they grew into it. That means they were somewhere, realized I have a flaw, and then go, that's just not for me. They said, I have to work on that. How do you work on that? Well, in certain things, we're very obvious about this. When it comes to exercise, you realize you have to make a specific plan. You got to make a commitment. I'm going to do it. X amount of time per day, X amount of lifts, X amount of time on the bike, whatever it may be, you make a specific goal on what you're working out and how you will get there to that end goal. We understand that with diet. We understand that with teaching. To teach, what does it take? Knowledge. Got to study. It takes practice. You've got to do it. Maybe learn from someone who's doing there, who's been there, done that. Go with a Bible class teacher. There's so many good teachers here. Pair with someone. Okay, but the New Testament isn't just about teachers. There's all kinds of areas we should be serving. And if you don't serve it, how do we know that you're not the one person who can reach or provide the words of encouragement that are needed for that precious soul in your community, your friend, your neighbor? How do we know that God didn't put you to help that person? It's very easy to disqualify ourselves, say, I'm not good enough. That, that might be true. I'm not good enough. But God can use me to do those great things. So he set specific goals. This morning, everyone individually, I can't do this. I can do this for myself all day. Koshka can help me with myself all day. I've got a lot of problems. I've got to figure out what are my issues? What do I do badly that I need to make good? What are some things that I need to start doing that are good and be better? What is it? And make a plan. Just say I need to be better is worthless. It is worth nothing. But to do something about it is life-changing. Aim for specific growth. And then, of course, you need to stay accountable. If you'll turn over to James, our final passage this morning, James 5 and verse 16. Not only does this apply certainly in the context of spiritual forgiveness of sins, but part of the specific plan is to have someone who helps you stay on target. Again, the world's got this figured out. We understand this when it comes to weight loss and exercise and even curriculums around teaching in and out of churches. We understand that there need to be systems and accountability. As Christians, when we live without it, we're ignoring common sense and Bible sense. And that's a problem. James 5, 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. How can we grow? Be thankful. Remember, they knew God, but they didn't honor him or be thankful to him. Aim for specific growth. Have a set plan. Say, what is my deficiency? How can I be better? Who can help me be better? When can I work on it? 
and stay accountable. Maybe that who is the person who can both help me grow and be there for me to teach me, to help mentor me to be better. So is there room for growth? Yes. Do we all have weaknesses? Of course. The question is only, will I trust that God can work through me to do great things? Or will I set back and allow Satan to convince me to do little or nothing? That's the choice. If you're here and you've never become a Christian, recognize that God can do great things, but the most important thing that he does that we should be thankful for and that should change us every day is that he gave us that gospel message, which is the power unto salvation. That means that Jesus died, and he died for you. He died for me. But if you're not a Christian, you haven't accepted that sacrifice. You're not benefiting from it. And so how do you do that? You believe that Jesus is the Christ, the resurrected Son of the living God. You confess him as Lord, saying, his will is done, not mine. Repent of your sins, say God's way works, mine is insufficient, and you're baptized, you can share in that death, burial, and resurrection. Or maybe you're a Christian, and like in James chapter 5, we need to stay accountable. I have not been doing the best I can, I need help. This is a good time to make that need known to the congregation. You can do that privately, you can do that publicly right now. If we can help you at all, come forward now as we stand and sing the invitations.